It's a special Giro d'Italia themed Ask Gs Anything this week on the channel. We've been asking you for your questions and we've got a whole host in. I'll be answering as many as we possibly can today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the race is kicking off today, Friday the 4th of May. In fact, by the time this video comes out, the first stage, a 9.9 kilometer individual time trial around Jerusalem, will be done and dusted. Won't yeah, you? and we've got to say as well, if you have access to the Eurosport player, then you'll also be able to tune in to a very special GCN race highlights and analysis program, which we are super excited about, aren't we? We are. Uh, si is hosting that today, and I'm looking forward to watching it myself. Uh, first up, though, a few fairly simple but very important questions about the Giro, starting with this from Meokawai. Uh, I am just a newbie, so what is the Giro d'Italia? Well, that is an important question, isn't it? Uh, so the Giro d'Italia is a bike race around Italy, okay? So it comprises of 21 individual stages, and the winner of the race is the rider that completes it in the fastest time. So the actual overall leaderboard is calculated using aggregate time, so for each of every one stage added up, and therefore the person with the least time at the end is the winner. Now just to complicate things ever so slightly, the race also celebrates the winner of each of those 21 stages. So at any one time, you could actually have a race within a race. Yes, uh, it sounds reasonably complicated, but actually you can get your head around it reasonably quickly. And the more you get your head around the technicalities of cycling, the better it is to watch, yeah. I personally find. Endlessly fascinating. Without wanting to further complicate things, because there are bonus seconds available during each stage and at the end of each stage, you can actually win the Giro d'Italia without completing the course in the <laughs> fastest time. But that we... has just overcomplicated <laughs> things, Dan. Uh, anyway, probably a point that needs uh, pointing out. Now. The person that is in the lead of the race gets to wear a very special jersey, as they do basically in every stage race in cycling. And for the Giro d'Italia, it is pink. The Tour de France, of course, is yellow. Pan asks Peter Pan, what's the story behind the Malia Rosa? Why pink? Well, there's quite a simple reason for this, isn't there? The people behind the creation of the Giro d'Italia all the way back in 1909 uh, was the national Italian sports newspaper, La Gazzetta della Sport. Uh, that paper was, and still to this day, is printed on pink sheets or paper, uh, <laughs> as it's a newspaper. And so they decided in order to promote that newspaper that they would make the leader's jersey of the race pink as well, hence La Maglia Rosa. That's right, and the pink theme continues to this day, which explains why Dan is wearing a very natty pink t-shirt and my Italian themed t-shirt also has flashes of pink on. Both of these are our celebratory t-shirts that are available for limited edition only in the GCN shop. They are indeed. And now if you want a few more details on the pink jersey and also 17 other very interesting facts about 17 Italian, other facts? Yeah, then you should watch this next video which is catchily titled Top 18 Giro d'Italia Facts. Did you know there was a jersey that was awarded to the last place rider on general classification? It was called La Maglia Nera, or the black jersey. And quite often there used to be a race within a race to see who could get the slowest time. Such was the prestige of wearing this jersey. Our next question comes in from Mark Yan. What's the average speed going to be by the riders in the nine kilometer time trial in Israel? It must be at least 55 kilometers per hour, isn't it? Well, yeah, you're probably not far off with your guess, but it is difficult to accurately predict the average speed because it depends on so many factors, doesn't it? Like uh, the weather, so for example, if it's wet, uh, how many corners there are in the stage, what the wind direction is. So yeah, it is hard to predict, but you're probably ballpark. Well, I'm gonna give it a go, so oh, go I've had a quick look at the map and the elevation profile and the weather conditions, and I'm going to predict a winning average speed go on. of 52.8 kilometers per hour, <sighs> just over 30 miles per hour. You know what's cruel about this, Dan, is that given the stage will already have finished by the time this video goes up, if you actually get it right, no one's gonna believe that yeah, we yeah, recorded it before. It? You can't make, uh, you can't. Right, uh, sticking with time trial themes, we've got this one from Bloomberg. I'll be at the time trial in Jerusalem, and let me tell you, it is gonna be a hot day. How do you think the heat will affect the race, the race, both from a technical standpoint and on a physiological standpoint? Well, teams and riders, especially in the modern era, are more than adept at coping with extreme conditions either in the cold or indeed in the heat. And looking at the forecast for the time trial today, maximum temperature of 32, chance of rain actually, 32 degrees centigrade, mm -hmm. that's about 90 Fahrenheit. So not particularly extreme when you consider what they have to deal with at races like the Tour Down Under in January, where yeah. the thermometer nudges closer to 40. Uh, the next two days on the sprint stages look more like 25 and 26, which, to be honest, is almost perfect cycling weather, isn't it? It does sound quite nice where I'm sitting right now. Uh, now, from a technical standpoint, 
all the equipment will be absolutely fine, won't it? The only thing that you might see is riders warming up for the time trial uh, wearing an ice vest to keep their core body temperatures cool. Otherwise, it's just the basics, really, making sure they stay well hydrated, rehydrate after the stage, and cool down as quickly as possible. Hmm. Now, you might be wondering why we have got uh, some snowy pictures whilst talking about <laughs> excessive heat just behind us. Uh, the reason is that you do get some particularly extreme conditions in both directions at the Giro d'Italia in May. Uh, I remember the first race that I I did there in 2009. It was extremely hot from start to finish, a bit too hot for me to be perfectly honest. But then if we look at this from 2013, who can forget that stage where we could barely see Vincenzo Nibli in his pink jersey in 2013 as he climbed up to a stage win at Tre Cimi di Lavaredo. That was quite well, I'm going to say epic. It was epic, and so epic, in fact, that we made a video, not about the race per se, but about the fans that had trekked for kilometres through freezing temperatures to go and watch at the side of the road. Brilliant. Worth a watch, that video, definitely. Looks like it was really cold that day, Si. It was. You must have been nice and tasty in the commentary booth. in the commentary box on the finish line, yeah, with heaters. <laughs> What's your name and where have you come from? Uh, my name is Ivo, we, we came from Czech Republic. Okay, and how have you got up to the top of Trecim de Lavaredo today? We walked. And how long has it taken you? I don't know, three or four hours. What do you want to see on this, this final stretch of road of the Giro d'Italia? Uh, no, I wanna, of course I want to see Nibali. Nibali, my favourite is also Rigoberto Uran, uh, Uran and also uh, we are fans of uh, Polish riders, Maika and uh, Niemet. Ah, happy memories there, hey Dan. Uh, right, next up, we've got this one from Michal Svoboda. Who can surprise us in the Giro d'Italia this year? I always like to try and pick out a few underdogs that might surprise at the Giro. Uh, in our preview show, which we will link to at the end of this one, I mentioned an Ecuadorian rider from Movistar called Richard Carapaz. After that show, I hasten to add and emphasise, he went on to take his first pro victory, uh, winning a stage and the overall classification of the Vuelta Asturias. Though I can't prove it once again because the show came out after he'd done it. Nevertheless, I'm expecting something from him because Movistar haven't really taken a big team leader to the race this year, so he should get quite a lot of freedom. He should, yeah. Uh, one rider who won't get freedom but still could surprise us, I think, is Sam Oman from Team Sunweb. Now, he'll be there, of course, in support of his team leader, Tom de Merlin. But he's a particularly impressive rider and definitely one to watch. Certainly at the Vuelta last year, he looked super strong until, unfortunately, he fell ill. But at this year's Giro d'Italia, he could well be a surprise super domestique. As Sunweb go for Giro number two. Yes. Well, hopefully Tom de Moulin won't be going for another Giro number two. But that's another, another <laughs> that point That was terrible. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, along similar lines to Omen, uh, I think that Jack Hay could be a surprise package for Mitchelton yeah. Scott. Uh, he's a young rider with a mountain bike background, similar to myself and Si, in fact. Although that is where the similarity yeah, is. Yeah, I was going to say, he's similar but faster. <laughs> yes. Much, much faster. Uh, he's really impressed me so far in 2018 and I think he's going to be a real key member of that squad who have a two-pronged attack because they have Esteban Chavez and Simon Yates both going for the overall classification so I'm expecting quite a lot from Jack Hay over the three weeks especially in the mountains. Uh, what is quite interesting though is this tweet and graphic from Killian Kelly on Twitter where he has shown the number of Grand Tour debutants at each year of the Giro d'Italia for the past few decades and interestingly this year has the fewest since 1994. Uh, we've got just 18 making their debut at the Giro and I think that is a side effect probably of the fact that we've gone down to eight man teams from nine. Yes you're probably right actually there aren't you I would imagine although you'd expect I guess to see a natural drop off if you've had loads of debutants for the past few years then they're maybe just going to be getting more experienced. Yes. I don't know, but I think you are probably right, to be fair. Uh, right, next question, we've got this from Yan Yan Morondoz. What's the fastest recorded time up Montezoncaland since it was introduced excuse me, into the Giro? And that, for those of you who don't know, is basically one of the most fearsome climbs in the whole of Europe. It's an absolute brute, isn't it? Well, I had to look up climbing-records.com for this, which is quite an interesting site if you're geeky and into your climbing stats uh, and how quick pro riders have gone up various climbs. Uh, they say that the record time came back in 2007 when Gilberto Simone and Leonardo Piepoli uh, climbed the Zonkelen, which is 9.8 k's at 12% in a time of 39 minutes and 3 seconds, which is almost a full minute and a half quicker than Rigoberto Uran and Naira Quintana went up it in 2014. Interesting, very interesting. Uh, right, next up we've got this from uh, Fusionic TH. This year's Giro isn't Tom de Moulin's preferred profile. I'd say he's got his best chance to beat Froome at the Tour. So why doesn't he focus on the Tour only? Is it really worth it to try and defend his title? 
Mm. I'm kind of with you there. I was quite surprised that he decided to come back and try and defend his Dura Italia title because it feels like he can either equal what he's done or fail. Those are the only two outcomes really, aren't they? And I was thinking at 27 years of age, that he would have ticked that box and head to the Tour de France as his main ambition for this year. I mean, we don't know whether he's not aiming for the Tour as well. He might well go on and try and do a good GC there, but I thought he would focus solely on that. Yeah, he has only got 12 race days under his belt though, in the lead up to the Giro, which is probably quite light. So maybe he's thinking about the bigger picture. Yeah, I hope so. So I think he could do really well at the yeah. Tour. And I hope that he does focus on the Tour as well this year, because I think he could do really well there. Yeah. Next question is from Lucky Sai. Hey. Not you, is it? No. Uh, quite visibly. Hi, right, because he's from the Philippines. Oh, yeah, from the Philippines, further proof. Uh, I want to know, how does the logistics system work, like transporting the team bikes from Europe to Israel? I uh, hope you can make a video about this. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, it's really complicated this time because uh, normally all the Grand Tours and the races are within the European Union, uh, whereas now this is the first Grand Tour to ever start outside the EU. Uh, the teams have had real trouble, uh, or not trouble exactly, but logistical nightmares. So every single item that the team takes into Israel has to be accounted for, down to the individual energy gels, which just seems absolutely bonkers. So all the team trucks and the team buses will be waiting for the riders in Sicily which is where the riders transfer to after three days of racing. Uh, so the riders will effectively just fly with their race bikes and that'll be about it. Uh, so yeah, they'll okay. get complicated. There's been a chartered plane or a number of them for the riders and staff, hasn't there? And there's been another plane, I think I'm right in saying, just for the bikes uh, to head over. I think I saw a picture of that the other day. Cool. Uh, okay. A few years ago, in fact just two years ago, in 2016, I headed over to Team Sky's hotel at the start of the Tour de France to find out what the logistics are like in terms of numbers, bottles, gels, bars, vehicles, etc. Uh, and it's quite complicated even when you don't head outside of Europe. You can find more details on that in this video. 55 bikes. They've got 100 rolls of bar tape, of which they will probably use around 66 because they change that every four days or so just to make sure the bikes look spick and span all of the time. They will also get through 30 bottles of Muckoff chain lube, 25 litres of Muckoff degreaser, and finally they have one kettle. No spare. And what they're going to do if it breaks. Right, just to wrap up quickly, we've got some nice speedy questions for you. This one from Matthew Gilster. What's the smallest margin of victory at the Giro d'Italia? 11 seconds apparently, uh, in 1948, uh, where Fiorenzo Magni uh, beat by 11 seconds, second place finisher Ezio Cecchi. Uh, that, okay. as far as I understand, is the closest ever finish. Last year was pretty close though, it wasn't was, it? So yeah. it was one second, I think, separated Dumoulin uh, from Nairo Quintana. It came down to that very last stage. What a race it was. Yeah, let's hope for more of the same on this year's route. In terms of the other classifications, I'm not entirely sure on them. I know that uh, Mark Cavendish really had to fight on the very last stage uh, for the points jersey just a few years ago when he was riding for quick step, but I'm not entirely sure. So let us know in the comments down below if you do know. Well, so Liam Sangaku has said, which GCN presenter will be there? Uh, well, so Emma is gonna be out there for the first rest day to make uh, a load of cool videos for us. Uh, and then I believe John Cannings from the Tech Channel is gonna be over there as well, swatting up on some pro bikes and generally stalking mechanics, I think. Um, so yeah, those two to start with, and then who knows, it's a long race. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe one of us will get to go out to Italy as well. Always a treat against the Tour of Italy. Yeah, stay tuned to GCN Tech and GCN itself uh, for many videos related to the Giro coming out over the next three weeks of racing. Finally, Sai, from Garau, uh, best stage to watch? Whoa. Well, the best stage, you'd probably say, is gonna be Monte Zoncalan. Also, at the back end of the race, uh, there's the stage that finishes up Bardonecchia. Yep. There's got the Colle della Finestra, which is possibly my favourite climb of all time. Uh, so those two would be great. But, you know, I can't wait just to see the start, the opening time trial, yeah. where you get to get a gauge of the rider's form. Brilliant. There's one particular stage, and this is not going to be very helpful at all because I've forgotten which one it is, uh, but <laughs> Terreno Adriatico often uses these roads towards the end of that week-long race, those incredibly steep but not particularly long climbs, because I think they produce some of the most exciting racing in Grand Tours at the moment. That'll uh, be the first full week, I would have thought, when uh, it's towards yeah, the end Yeah, it's that. near where the second rest day is uh, up there in Italy, so if I remember it, 
I'll try and remember to put it in the comments below this video. Or maybe we could have out. a nice graphic after you've... Yes. Uh, yeah, when the video... You probably shouldn't have said that. Everyone's going to be disappointed. <laughs> right, well, that brings us to the end of this week's Ask GC Anything Giro d'Italia special. Don't forget, you can leave all your questions for cycling-related uh, stuff just down below in the comment section. If you've enjoyed the video, there's a thumbs-up button, which we'd very much appreciate you clicking on. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we promise this all the way through, but if you've missed our Giro d'Italia preview, you can find that by clicking on the box uh, somewhere within this box.